Welcome everyone to the Curatorial Roundtable. Um, the Roundtable is a weekly presentation where I ask distinguished curators and directors from all over the world to speak about their practice and what feels pressing for them at this moment. And so today I'm um, grateful to have Ileana Vokaniki with us. And I'm just going to read a short bio about Ileana, um, that she is a curator, theorist, and educator. She's the incoming director of the Kunsthalle Bern and the founding director of State of Concept in Athens. Um, she's got a compelling record of group and solo exhibitions and research projects and in institutions worldwide as the director of State of Concept. She's changed the landscape of Athens art scene, bringing to the city exhibitions of artists such as forensic architecture, Kader Atia, Kapwani Kiwanga, Trinti Minha, Laura Provost, and many others. She's the founder of um, the research platform, the Bureau of Care, which has been foregrounding conversations around the politics and ethics of care since 2020. Um, Ileana has curated exhibitions for institutions such as um, the Reina Sophia, Eflux, Kunst Institute Meli, and has curated public programs for the Vera List Center for Art and Politics in New York. She's taught in academies, independent spaces, museums, and foundations internationally and publishes regularly in journals such as Eflux and Freeze. And um, so with that, just a little bit of housekeeping for the day, which is to say that Ileana um, will speak for 45, 50 minutes, something like that. Um, please put at that point your questions and comments and in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll have, say, 10 minutes or so for Ileana to address your questions. And with that, I hand it over to you to hit play and start your presentation, Ileana. Right. Um, um, I'll leave it like that for, for now. So I'll make a little okay. in introduction. Stephen, thank right. you so much for the invitation. It's uh, also uh, very strange. I mean, and also serendipitous that I'm returning to the SFVA uh, the same uh, time. It's like the winter. Last time I was physically there and it was just before, I think, a week before COVID uh, broke right. in That's the right. world. So. <laughs> Um, it was yeah February of two thousand and 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 twenty. So I'm very very happy to to return. Um, and thank you also to Re for the wonderful um, coordination of everything. Um, I'll I'll start by also li a little bit introducing myself and and who I am. Uh, I'm I'm a person that arrives from from Greece. I was born and bred there. Uh, during the time that I was born, which was uh, the '80s. Um, uh, Greece was a monocultural society, um, and I think that's that's quite important to say, where 99.9% .9 of the people in the country were Greeks. So I, I, you know, I was I was born in a in a place without the internet back then, of course, uh, where um, everybody looked like me and everybody thought like me and everybody spoke like me and everybody had the same religion like me and all these things. Um, and when I was 18, I was kind of suffocated by this sameness. So um, I decided to, to study. I wanted to be an artist and uh, I went to the UK uh, to study as an artist. And very quickly, I realized, of course, also that the fact that I came from a periphery um, uh, of the global south uh, and the European south um, meant that I was a little bit, um, let's say, um, back when it came uh, to contemporary art. I remember my professor, Shelley Sachs, she said to me, Liana, you need to catch up. I was kind of a bit un until Andy Warhol and I didn't didn't know what was happening with the young British artists and everything. I'm saying that because it was a really a life changing experience going into the library back then. There was no Internet again, as I said, um, and realizing that there are so many magnificent artists that have said things so beautifully and so eloquently that I'm actually not an artist. And it's more interesting for me to read um, about art and, um, you know, think about art and discuss the artistic practices and, and cultural practices. 
So I lived in the UK for, for a period. I was also involved in, uh, in commercial galleries. I was a director in a commercial gallery in London. And then in 2005, I decided to go back uh, for family reasons, but also because um, I wanted to, to start thinking outside uh, of the frameworks that I was used to. Um, I returned af just after the Olympics uh, in Athens when there was this kind of euphoria that we will be, um, you know, having kind of like a cultural um, a renaissance of, of some sorts. Um, and then, of course, just a couple of years later, the, the financial global crisis uh, started uh, and things were, were very, very, very different. However, that allowed, that created ground somehow for contemporary arts to to flourish in in uh, in Athens, and in about 2013, I mean, it was it started already in 2011, uh, uh, very much as a nomad project, and then in 2013 we already had a space, and state of concept became a reality. Um, in parallel to being a curator and writer, uh, I was also a journalist because I had to somehow uh, make my living. And this really, really uh, affected the way that I understand curating. I'm, I'm a curator that very much responds to the moment, that in, is very much inspired by current affairs, and I somehow want to always include them and introduce them and um, um, uh, attempt to answer questions that are of the now uh, through the, the work that I do. Um, at State of Concept, for about a decade, we've um, tried to develop um, a system, or let's say a, a format rather, of how to do exhibitions, which was very much involved with chapters, with analyzing subject matters throughout the year with various exhibitions that were kind of grouped together uh, into subject matters. And this is, uh, is let's say, a format that I, I will be also continuing um, at Kunsthalle Bern from, from April onwards. Um, and it's a way of, of working that I very much like also with all my individual projects outside of, of State of Concept. Um, I have decided to speak today about my experience with uh, Survival Kit, uh, where I was artistic director in 2022. And the reason is, I was telling Stephen before, um, it's really an exhibition that educated me. Uh, I learned and it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of a discussion about unlearning or relearning or learning otherwise or differently. Um, but for me, uh, it was learning. It was really a proper learning experience. Um, uh, and I think um, it's possibly one of the most important projects for me, not necessarily uh, because it's an international show, but because of the experience that I had with it. So I was contacted sometime in 2020, um, end of 2020, early 2021, to think of a proposal um, for a survival kits. A survival kits is a yearly event. It's a little bit like a biennial, but it's not a biennial because it's a yearly event. And um, it's um, it's not an open call. Uh, it's run by the Latvian Center of Contemporary Art, which is based in Riga, the capital of Latvia. Um, and they invite curators to think uh, and propose uh, subject matters and themes for uh, for every um, every edition of the festival under the let's say bigger and wider umbrella of this question of of survival. And it's interesting because it started um, a few years before State of Concept started exactly under the same premise of having a global crisis, uh, financial crisis that had affected also heavily Latvia, Latvia being also the one of the, well, actually the poorest of the three uh, Baltic uh, countries, um, very similar in, in many ways to Greece. Um, so at, at that moment, I, ha I was already uh, had the second year of developing the Bureau of Care, which is a research platform that is uh, still ongoing. Um, and the idea um, and the first, let's say, draft uh, of, a, of a proposal that I made for, for LCCA was related to concepts that, re that had to do with the politics and ethics of care. Um, so I had a very kind of fix, uh, you know, research trajectory and I thought okay this is the next step of how do you try all the theory um, uh, into a, a platform that is a big uh, festival that is running for two months uh, that has a very active public program apart from a, a, a big group exhibition 
and I think it's very interesting to see how curators sometimes we you know we have this disruption uh, that happens from from the persons that host us and it's these beautiful disruptions that create new concepts um, and one of the reasons that I chose to speak of the subject. So what you're looking at here is a, a very, very small uh, museum in, in Riga, in Latvia. I was invited to look uh, to look at spaces uh, and see the, the previous edition, which was curated by two curators together, uh, Oval Dermusoglu and uh, Joanna Warsha. Um, Joanna and Oval decided to abandon the format of we find a building in, in, in the city uh, and chose to use all these tiny museums that exist in, in Riga. And it's a very interesting thing uh, what happens in Riga, which, for example, we do not have uh, in Greece. I have not known it in the Netherlands, where I'm also partly based. Um, former homes of uh, literally f literary figures from the country are turned into uh, small museums that are run by, uh, you know, uh, small groups of, uh, of civil servants together with kind of larger groups of, um, uh, of uh, volunteers. And this is Orger's Vatsitis. He's one of the most important uh, writers and poets from Latvia. A very interesting story of his life. He started, of course, to give you also the overview, uh, the Baltic states were part of uh, uh, of Russia, Soviet Russia, uh, and they um, uh, the, the revolution occurred in the 80s, during, I think, a couple of months after the Perestroika, which was the last phase of, of, uh, of Soviet Russia, um, and they have been in uh, independent sovereign states since uh, the early 90s. I think it was 1991. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, Odra was very much part of a Soviet legacy um, of, uh, of, of, of what is now today uh, Latvia. Um, he grew up as, a, as an extremely uh, proud Marxist, uh, was receiving a lot of youth prizes, literary prizes um, from the Soviet state. Uh, so he was revered throughout the Soviet uh, state uh, for his talent. And then, of course, as it happens, when you do live under a regime, he um, very slowly uh, but very firmly uh, realized that it's a different thing to have ideas and it's a, it's a completely different thing to, to have these ideas being implemented in a, in a state format that becomes repressive. Um, so you see in the later period of his life, um, he completely shifts and there is a lot of criticality in his writing um, about specifically repression uh, and uh, censorship that occurred in, uh, in, uh, in Latvia. And um, this was uh, one of the reasons that I was intrigued during that visit. Um, and it, the hospitality was was so so heartwarming. Uh, I remember the director of of this very small museum gave me this tiny little book that you see on uh, on your left, which was the only thing that they had. It was from from the eighties that was translated in English. And she said, I, I I think that you will very much enjoy reading his poems. Um, uh, but it's the only, you know, he he had a very prolific career. Of course, it's the only, uh, it's the only ones that we have uh, in English. So I hope that you will enjoy them. So my whole idea about discussing about the, the politics and ethics of care, and specifically focusing on on care labor, which was very much what I was researching at the time. Um, uh, was kind of thrown out of the window. Uh, and on my way back uh, home, I, I, I opened this little book that I had in my in my bag and I started reading uh, this incredible poetry. Um, so the title of, uh, of the exhibition and the theme of the exhibition basically arrives from uh, this encounter with this very small museum. And it was The Little Bird Must Be Caught. And it's um, it was very interesting to me that he used a lot of um, metaphor with animals uh, because, of course, there was so much censorship that, you know, books could not be published, artists were being uh, arrested. Um, and um, I thought um, uh, I thought it was so interesting that he's writing about uh, from the voice of the oppressor, 
uh, he's writing about how this little bird is hatching its eggs, it wants to multiply, and how we need to kind of rein it in, and we, we, we shouldn't allow it to, to, to become more than one, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so um, the exhibition basically um, build itself uh, through uh, through this concept of oppression uh, and censorship, and specifically its relationship to sound or the lack of sound. Um, so there are a variety of subject matters that are addressed uh, through uh, this exhibition. And at the time, of course, I also wanted to think um, through um, COVID and the fact that COVID created some new forms of silences uh, that we had not uh, um, experienced before. Uh, and then a couple of months, that was November 2021, and a couple of months uh, later, um, the Ukraine uh, and Russia war happened. And this changed completely uh, the way that I understood the subject in relationship to censorship, the relationship and the legacies of the Soviet states uh, and Soviet Russia, and how that uh, would be uh, addressed in uh, in um, in uh, in Latvia uh, after uh, what happened, and of course um, there was an, a very big influx of refugees that were arriving from Ukraine in 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 Riga. Um, there were a lot of uh, cultural spaces that uh, were trying to uh, address this and find ways of. Uh, of creating collective kitchens and soups or uh, provide um, um, mental health care professionals for free where there was like collective discussions. And of course, there was another issue that Riga was um, one of the cities that um, were, let's say, having a, a new uh, interest from the international art world because there was a biennial that had started a few years back uh, from a Russian oligarch uh, that was based in Latvia, uh, which had created, let's say, um, a more vivid uh, art ecology in the city, but uh, that now uh, had to shut down. And of course, this meant also very difficult and different discussions and relationships that were happening because of the of the Riga Biennial and all those that were, um, you know, securing their livelihood from from this biennial and no more could feel that they could uh, continue working. Um, so um, I, I'm I'm going to start kind of describing a little bit the exhibition and uh, and the works. Um, before I go to that, I also wanted to speak a little bit about the building because it's quite interesting. The concept of survival kit is there is a very close relationship with the municipality um, and uh, uh, because also of the financial crisis back then when it was founded that created so many empty buildings, the idea was that we occupy somehow these empty buildings every time with every edition of, uh, of survival kit. Um, uh, and when I say occupy, it's very much... Uh, you know, um, not literal, because of course there is rent to be paid. Uh, so these these big spaces are usually rented out. Now, um, the specific uh, building that uh, was uh, was found uh, after we did a little bit of scouting together with the uh, with um, with the team of the of the institution. Um, was no longer I had already started developing the exhibition and of course it was no longer available because it belonged to a Russian oligarch and um, it was not acceptable and I'm saying this because of course it shows how you know historical events when you are when you are part of history transforming uh, or happening um, there are a lot of things that change um, when you're thinking an exhibition. So the the event that we finally uh, arrived to um, was uh, a former bank that had also co collapsed during the 2007-2012 crisis, um, which was closed for many, many years. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it was until mid-October of 2022. This is the entry uh, to the exhibition. Um, there was a, a two-floor exhibition with, uh, with a participation of about 33 uh, artists. And I really tried to um, address um, a lot of 
questions uh, that related to censorship as was as it was understood uh, uh, in the local context, um, but also uh, to try to very gently and with care uh, highlight the problematics also that arrive from these tense relationships. Um, and of course, it was a good lesson for me as a, um, let's say, as a, um, you know, progressive uh, leftist uh, European that arrives in a place that where, um, you know, there is also this nostalgia for, for a leftist uh, past that arrives because of ignorance as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that has kind of, let's say, resurfaced many times uh, in many uh, uh, places where the the you know the the lived experience of communism is completely different than the ideas of uh, uh, communist values that many of us might read in the books, and I'm saying that because um, it, the the let's say the need from the public and the desire also from the institution was to highlight these problematic relationships, the oppression, the censorship. Um, but for me, it was just more of a platform in order to address questions that relate to other types of censorships um, that are not necessarily as visible. Um, we start with the work of Tabitha Rezaire, who is uh, an artist that has been looking into um, um, questions that relate to colonial legacies um, and also neo-colonial um, let's say, um, realities that have to do also with, uh, with, with nature. This piece of hers um, discusses um, very much um, uh, her personal relationship uh, to, um, to, let's say, the, the land of her, uh, of her ancestors, that she kind of leaves, let's say, a little bit um, vague and unknown, um, using um, fabrics and patterns that arrive from the African continent, uh, using materials such as copper, which has been, let's say, one of the main uh, materials of extraction that arrives from the African continent, from various countries, not just the obvious ones that we know. Uh, the piece also has a sound um, um, component, which is her voice uh, reciting uh, older texts that relate to, uh, to land and, um, let's say, worship of land and taking care of land um, and knowledges that have been completely erased because of the colonial uh, footprint. Um, and that also has to do with, of course, um, agricultural uh, methodologies, not just, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the evident culprits that we would imagine. Um, the second uh, and third, actually, because on the background you have another piece, uh, piece that I wanted to discuss uh, was uh, Yuris Boiko uh, and, and uh, Yaldis uh, Ledinis, which is a, a duo from, uh, I would say, uh, from the, the, the Soviet era. Uh, they had, um, they have been uh, working for uh, uh, about twenty years uh, until the death of of one of them, and they're very much a very important part of the history that uh, is there before uh, the revolution uh, in the nineties. Um, they have been working with musicians, artists, um, collectives, uh, their own students from uh, the academies uh, that they taught. Um, and one of their um, uh, beautiful pieces was a few months before the revolution in Latvia. Uh, it's called Goodbye Empire. And it was basically a troop, a nomad, let's say, collection of bodies going throughout uh, Latvia um, and performing um, what they understood as um, imperial Soviet um, 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 performative, let's say, um, uh, pieces uh, where they were um, waving goodbye to an empire that they thought was dying. And of course, it, it, you know, it was a piece that became a reality. It was a piece that uh, was um, censored and they they 
they tried to have events and they had to have these events happen impromptu because whenever they tried to have an organized event, it was canceled and um, uh, they were charged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there are a lot of other pieces of theirs that they've done, but so we went through the archive of uh, of the family of of the artists and we selected a lot of imagery um, that arrived from all these trips where these uh, where this piece was performed. Um, and a lot of raw material um, because they were also filming all these um, encounters that they had and the reactions of the public. Um, the third piece is a piece that many of you or some of you might be familiar with. It has been shown quite a lot uh, in New York these last years. It's uh, Wu Tsang. Uh, and uh, the subject matter of the video is Fred Moten dancing um, um, in drag, dancing uh, at a beautiful uh, piece. And for Wu, um, it's it's a very important, um, let's say, connection to um, uh, a living, um, pivotal, important activist um, uh, for uh, civic society um, and the legacies that arrive from music from the 60s onward uh, and the political uh, connotations that it had for the civil rights movement in the US very specifically. Um, so it's 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 a stunning, a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, and I think you also can find it online on, on YouTube uh, to see. I would totally recommend. Um, there was also another um, piece that was throughout the, the building, which was uh, sound pieces from Laure Prouveau, uh, the French uh, artist, um, discussing silence uh, in her very um, surreal way. Uh, um, the building, as you see on the on the ground floor, was like very very traditional kind of old fashioned bank from uh, you know from a previous century with a lot of wood wood paneling, and then the top floor looks very much like a <laughs> kind of like a Black Mirror episode, which is kind of more contemporary. And for me, that was also an, a very interesting juxtaposition that I thought, yeah, this this is a building to have an exhibition there. Um, this is uh, this is a piece by Susan Phillips, who is an Irish artist. Um, it's it's an older piece of hers. It's called Seven Sisters, and it's um, it's a song basically uh, from a, a, a choir um, uh, that she also participates in. She also sings with, which recounts the story uh, of uh, sisters uh, that uh, were into a feud uh, because of uh, inheritance and land. It's a very old Irish song. Um, and for me, that was very interesting to, uh, to bring uh, in Latvia because I forgot to mention one a very interesting part of the story of the country and of course the Baltic states, which was that during the revolution uh, in the early 90s, the revolution was uh, coined, uh, I think it was from a local uh, ethnologist, but this was kind of um, described also in the international press as a singing revolution. And the reason was because they um, they were doing peaceful protests of songs um, and ma mainly folk songs that were shared through uh, the region. Uh, and there was this infamous, let's say, massive performance that they did, which was they were holding hands one next to the other and created a massive line that transcended, I think it was more than 15 kilometers that transcended the three countries. Um, so I also thought of this closeness and these kinships, these forms of relationships that exist between um, countries that belong to a bigger umbrella of something. This was also very much a case in Yugoslavia, uh, which is a region with artists that I've, I've worked with um, a lot. Um, and these um, also tensions that might be created between, let's say, ri rivaling siblings, which is very much what happens also between <laughs> actual brothers and sisters, we all know that. Um, and also, I, I was thinking of that in relationship specifically to the war uh, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, two countries that um, 
also had very close relationships. Um, I, I have a lot of Ukrainian and Russian friends, and they keep discussing how, um, you know, half of them might have been Ukrainian, one of them or Russian, and they kept going to one other's country. They shared the language or uh, there were a lot of similarities between the languages, etc. And how that these affinities and these these kinships are very abruptly ruptured because of uh, of, of wars. Um, and this is Ahmed Ogut's piece. It was a newly commissioned piece uh, for um, for Survival Kid that we actually co-commissioned with the Dhaka Art Summit. Um, in Bangladesh, but I'll I'll I left it also for the end. I'll I'll come back to it. Um, I ah, I forgot to mention that here you see at the windows uh, of the space a piece by Greek artist Chrysanthi Kunyanaki, which is um uh, is a new is a language that she has created herself, where um. Uh, logos and slogans and chants uh, from the history um, of uh, of uh, the Latvian revolution, but also from uh, uh, marches and important historical moments from, from Greece kind of mingle. And it's, uh, I think she also has a couple of quotes uh, from May 68. So she's kind of um, rethinking a little bit, um, uh, you know, the revolutionary as a concept uh, that becomes, um, let's say, a, a stencil uh, on a on a road, or a street, uh, or a banner, or or. So, I'm going back also to the little uh, book. Uh, this is Valdis Villerus. Um, he is an artist in his late eighties, and he was the artist that did the illustrations for the little book of Ojars Vachetis. So um, we we met with him, and he was kind enough to to give us the whole uh, series of of drawings that he actually did. And he was a very close friend to Vatsietis. Um, and he was very excited that someone was discovering that little tiny book uh, from the eighties uh, in English. Uh, um, I thought it was a very important uh, component of the exhibition as well, given the fact that um, these generations of artists have also tried to escape from a specific language that was very much, uh, let's just say, fed, forced fed to them uh, in relationship to how, um, as a Soviet artist, you 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 can uh, you know you can develop your practice. Um, and this is forensic architecture. Um, it's uh, two pieces, actually, two different investigations uh, uh, that they did. One is from 2014, which uh, was the first, let's say, uh, uh, part of the, of the, or less, it was not the first part, but it was kind of like the first evident to the West part of the conflict uh, with the Crimea War, uh, where they're documenting uh, or rather debunking uh, Russian propaganda in relationship to uh, a radio station um, that was bombed in uh, in Kiev. And the second one um, is um, uh, an investigation into uh, the bombing of schools during the these first months of the war from, from February until September, where we had the exhibition um, in, uh, in Latvia. And this is Mikola Ridni, um, is a is a famous now piece of his No No No. It's it's again a piece uh, uh, is a film that he made uh, in the regions where um, currently have been occupied by Russia again, which is Donetsk uh, uh, and Donev, uh, discussing also um, and I think is a very brave piece that is coming from a Ukrainian artist that is discussing. Um, also, the different perspectives that uh, uh, that arrive from within the Ukrainian society, specifically in relationship to where you are based geographically in Ukraine. Um, so it's interesting to see that, which is an older film uh, from from 2016, uh, to see how, uh, of course, those that are closely related to to Russia consider those that uh, uh, are. Um, um, celebrating the Maidan revolution uh, as traitors and vice versa. Um, and it's interesting also because it has been difficult for him to show the film in, in Ukraine in the previous years. Um, 
so it's you know also kind of a, a, a more let's say hidden or unseen side uh, of uh, of of what we understand about this conflict. Um, uh, and this this is very much uh, a, a very very uh, interesting piece uh, from uh, I can I can never pronounce her same surname. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm saying it wrongly, um, um, uh, who uh, has made this incredible film, is a basically an ongoing um, uh, film of or research, you can say, uh, or collection of films that become one installation of US soldiers uh, from, um, I, I think it's from the beginning of YouTube until today, um, dancing uh, themselves uh, in front of the screen during, uh, you know, being uh, sent to wherever places in, in the globe. And it's questioning uh, the relationship uh, that we have, uh, you know, with who is the good guy, who is the bad guy, what is the good army, what is the bad army. But it was a very interesting piece to have in the exhibition, um, also because the period that we opened the exhibition. Similarly, um, the Berlin Biennial was having a, a big discussion and a conflict in relationship to specific artworks that were showing um, the Abu Ghraib uh, tortures. Um, uh, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe some of you are, are um, not familiar with them because they, um, they're quite, they're quite some many years now that they happened, but these images arrived basically from uh, a leak um, uh, from, uh, and I think it was WikiLeaks later on. Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, um, and they became basically a very big issue for the U.S. Army and the U.S. government because they have proven that Iraqi prisoners were being tortured in uh, non-recognized um, locations throughout Iraq. Um, and um, uh, there was a French artist that used these images and basically blew them up in size, I mean, um, and they were exhibited at the Berlin Biennial. Uh, and of course, there was a very big part of um, the participating artists that were arriving as well from the Middle East, complaining that, of course, the victims, their families, most of them were alive, were not informed about uh, the usage of these images. Um, so for me, it was a very interesting juxtaposition of uh, using um, what we would say is public material in the case of Inge, because, of course, these videos were uploaded by the soldiers themselves and they are of themselves. Um, uh, or of their own accord, in any case, they were they were allowing for these uh, to be uh, uh, uploaded. Um, uh, you know, so apart from the uh, evil, non-evil, uh, good guy, bad guy, uh, it's also this idea of um, what is allowed to be seen and what is uh, public, uh, let's say, property, what is uh, the commons in that sense in relationship to images, which I thought was uh, uh, very, very interesting. Um, I'll move on to Candice Brides um, and her Ode to Whiteness. I think it's a seminal piece that uh, will stay in the, you know, in art history. Um, it's uh, it's a piece where Candice has been for, I think, four years now, um, uh, hearing to speeches uh, specifically, I would say, from the US, US Australia, uh, UK, and also South Africa, from where she comes, of uh, white persons, uh, not necessarily far, far right or alt right, uh, but also uh, identifying themselves as liberals, where she has been using their um, discussions on the concept of whiteness and, and uh, on the on uh, race discussions. And she has been um, uh, using the words by uh, employing her own voice and performing this whiteness, being herself uh, a white Jewish uh, South African. Um, I think it's an excellent piece for many reasons, because um, specifically, I would say <laughs> for many reasons, but specifically uh, because it's um, 
it, it turns uh, the artistic voice into a, a very specific instrument. It turns it into itself, um, looking through, um, you know, also the privileges of the white artist, um, but also because it it really uh, um, leaves there bare for us to see these nuances that arrive uh, from this supposed progressive, you know, this, these very tiny little racisms that arrive from supposed progressive uh, uh, voices. So there is not just the blatant racism of the alt-right, but it's also the white innocence uh, that Gloria Becker speaks about uh, of, of the progressive white uh, that I thought was very interesting. Um, I, I don't have a picture of uh, Kapwani Kiwanga's um, uh, piece for the exhibition because it was a sound piece. Um, again, uh, Kapwani, uh, just uh, similarly to Wu, uh, was using um, uh, traditional, or let's say, not traditional, but um, um, symbolic uh, and uh, important songs uh, for the civil rights movement in the US. Uh, specifically for her, it was Nina Simone. And it was a piece that I had commissioned for her solo exhibition at Kunstinstitut Meli, where she employed um, a, a group of musicians that arrived from different disciplines and were playing different instruments to recompose um, uh, uh, Nina Simone's um, work uh, in, into a new piece. Um, uh, I Got No Life. I, I'm sure that most of you know the piece. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic kind of new iteration of uh, a very minimal version of what is um, a piece of music that evokes very specific things, which I'm very happy to share um, later on uh, through my phone, if you want. Um, um, this is Almagul, Almagul Benyakhleva. She's uh, an artist from uh, Belarus uh, who has been using AI uh, to um, compose imagery uh, from the riots that have been happening uh, from, uh, uh, I would say, 2017 until today. Um, it's uh, it's it's an, a film installation with uh, foot photographs. Um, I mean, you can see if you zoom in. I don't know if I can actually zoom in. Um, some images that uh, are, let's say, iconic um, uh, meetings between um, Putin uh, and uh, important figures of the political scene there. Um, um, also, footage that arrived from. Uh, rioters that were trying to document police violence during these years, um, uh, footage that she has been trying to salvage because uh, because of censorship, it has been kind of coming down throughout the years. Um, and they're very, you know, also by the use of, of, uh, of uh, AI, they become uh, extremely disturbing and extremely powerful uh, images of, let's say, uh, the, not not realistic dystopia, but very much close to 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 reality. And uh, then we come to Gilgamesh, um, which was also um, an important piece in the exhibition. It's a film by Anton Vidokl and Pelin Tan. I actually have a trailer for us to see here. Um, now, Gilgamesh, I don't know if you are familiar with the story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is one, uh, let's say, figure, uh, a prehistoric figure, um, as important as Ulysses uh, from, from Odyssey. It was a hero, basically, that defied death, uh, trying to find uh, his friend and to resurrect also his friend who had died. Um, the version that Tan and Vidokl are presenting to us is, uh, I, I'm calling it a pro proto-feminist tale, because Gilgamesh in the film now is a woman. Um, also, um, the film is accompanied uh, by uh, a very big uh, light box that is uh, documenting the history of languages that have either been um, forbidden uh, and um, made extinct uh, or are dying uh, away. Also trying to 
um, highlight uh, the fact that word and language can become a revolutionary tool in itself and uh, can uh, also ignite extreme violence because it has all these national components and um, um, to it. Um, so uh, the film is actually uh, in Kurdish with English subtitles. Uh, Pelin uh, Tan is a Turkish uh, theoretician uh, of architecture and, uh, crit and a critic, an art critic. And um, of course, for her, it was uh, extremely important to have the film in Kurdish for the specific reason that Kurdish language was forbidden in Turkey for many, many decades. Uh, and there have been a lot of uh, murders of, of Kurdish citizens uh, just because of their identity. Um, and also for Anton, he has lived and worked in the region for many, uh, many years and is very close uh, to uh, the Kurdish struggle. Um, I'll, I'll proceed to try to, let's see. Çıva gepenen bir kurda diçe, bir rüzemin bir keser. Çıva dilemin rebene, hasret emin bezar. Bunal dilemin de çıva eşhene. Çıva ez dişi bin kese giri, vitiye kirriye gibi. So we move on to uh, Sami Balohi, uh, uh, a piece that I had seen uh, at Documenta 14 in Athens, and I think it was also shown uh, at uh, at uh, Castle uh, that same year in 2017. Um, a really, really, really powerful uh, piece by Sami, where he's juxtaposing uh, current extraction uh, in uh, uh, in the Congo. Uh, together with the colonial uh, residue and, and histories that come with it. So um, the the installation is uh, basically um, a vitrine with um, these uh, crosses um, that operated uh, more or less as a exchange, um, as, as money uh, for, uh, for people from the Congo, um, because they have been using copper very much from the, let's say, primordial times from from the ancient times and before the Europeans arrived and started extracting it um, and uh, the use of this or let's say the appropriation of this uh, specific symbol uh, from the Catholic Church that came with the colonizers and tried to civilize uh, and westernize um, uh, the population and also to impose a specific religion to them uh the the um uh, it's part also the part of the installation is a film uh from a current uh factory uh somewhere outside Lumumbasi uh where it's the, let's say the biggest um uh, pool of of copper uh and the biggest kind of uh region to to extract um i thought it was a you know a very um very important piece to have, mainly because there's very little discussion um, in relationship to, um, you know, the linear um, continuation of uh, repression that exists because uh, of neocolonialism in, in the continent. Uh, neocolonialism that, of course, is not related to nationalism and the concept of the nation, because it is um, disguised uh, from uh, the corporation and the uh, international uh, business that um, you know doesn't have um, doesn't have a, a, an identity, a national identity, at least from the outside. But the it's quite interesting that, for instance, the relationship of the Congo with with Belgium continues through these um, multinational corporations that in fact are in their majority Belgian Belgian owned um 
Next is uh, Mariam Tafakori, who is a, um, an incredible filmmaker from Iran. Uh, we had um, a series of her films into uh, an installation of um, uh, of old uh, kind of traditional uh, 80s televisions. Um, Mariam uh, has been doing a series of short films uh, where she's uh, extracting pieces um, and experts from films, from important films in Iranian uh, film uh, cinema history, uh, trying to show um, the repression that exists specifically for uh, for women uh, through these kind of educational uh, films that exist uh, that arrive from uh, from from the regime, uh, but also uh, from film or filmmakers uh, and films um, of these last decades of filmmakers are trying somehow to transcend and you know come over these uh, these borders of of repression and rules where these rules of course exist also in the public space that women and men cannot touch each other one of the films for instance is called uh, the handbag and uh, she has uh, taken um, experts from films where you're seeing how the handbag is used as a way for a man and a woman to touch each other um, because they're both trying to get a handbag or a man is like trying to grab the handbag from from a woman um, because they're not allowed to show on film two hands of a man and a woman being uh, touching um so this was the film installation of uh, uh of um of Mariam, there was a, uh, also uh, an image uh, from Sanya Ivekovic. Uh, I have a very close and long-term relationship with Sanya. I think the most important feminist artist of former Yugoslavia at the moment. Um, and there was a, 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 an image that we salvaged from, Sa from by, with Sanya when I was visiting her in, in Zagreb. We, we discovered it. We didn't know it exists in, in her archive, which is uh, from a performance of hers in the 70s, where she basically puts a black uh, gaffer tape on, on her mouth and she greets everybody that arrives uh, into the space, of course, discussing also censorship that was existing during Tito's uh, Yugoslavia, T -T Tito's reign. So I thought it was a very nice juxtaposition to have this uh, image of Sanya. The majority of Sanya's works were in, in another uh, uh, section of, of the exhibition, but just for uh, reference. Um, also part of the exhibition was a selection of images that came uh, from uh, the uh, Museum of the Revolution that exists in Riga. This is actually uh, an image from uh, the um, one of the of the main squares in the city. I thought it was very interesting to have randomly these images throughout the exhibition space. Uh, and it was a very interesting reaction to see also from the local public that, uh, you know, uh, the director of the LCCA told me, oh, you know, there is there is an image from this series of my sister. She got married during the revolution and there is an image of her running with her wedding dress and her husband in, in the square trying to go to the to the riots to participate to the riots. There were a lot of older people that were, uh, you know, describing their homes and how they uh, recognized, uh, you know, images and uh, instance from from that uh, week um also because of course uh the majority of uh of uh, uh of military uh, as we see in this image was stationed in uh, in front of uh, radio stations uh, and tv stations in in latvia for the specific reason of trying to delay the news of these uh, let's say riots and quiet um, marches that were happening throughout the city this is another piece of of sanya it's uh, uh it's from uh from a series that she was doing uh, for Tito specifically, there's a very famous piece of hers, a very famous photograph of hers, supposedly masturbating in her balcony whilst uh, Tito is uh, is parading underneath. And this is part of, of, of that series where you see a lot of uh, individuals in their balconies looking at Tito. Uh, and are, they are the ones that were not allowed to participate uh, because they were not loyal subjects. Therefore, uh, you know, it was unsure what they would do if they were in the public downstairs where you see all the people that are the loyal subjects that are clapping. 
Um, and uh, this is another uh, Belarusian artist, Marina Naprushkina. Uh, it's a collage. It's uh, a collage painting, basically, that she has made into uh, various uh, uh, editions. And it's basically a reiteration of uh, a poem by... Uh, oh, I don't have the close-up. I think it's Zoe Leonard. Uh, Stephen, please correct me. I want a dike for a president. I think is is this U.S. artist uh, that has done this uh, this poem um, of you know uh, the different type of president that they would want. Um, it's it's quite known, but I don't remember if it was Eileen Miles or it was uh, Zoe, Zoe Leonard. Um, we can Google it afterwards and find out. Um, uh, so Marina's contribution is is this uh, painting, a uh, collage of a painting, where she's also making these um, fabric um, banners um, in in Russian um, that were addressing the current uh, situation of the of the conflict. Uh, and this is Kristaps Epners, who is a Latvian artist. This was an installation you can't really see uh, inside that vault. Uh, you have rice uh, that uh, is like a big heap of rice uh, with a lot of images uh, of churches. Um, and he has been following a very small community in Latvia of Russians that are with uh, Ru Russian Orthodox uh, that are from the old uh, calendar, that's how it's called, that have been extremely repressed and uh, persecuted in Russia um, and went to Latvia for that reason and these last years, they have also been persecuted in Latvia as well. So it's very small communities that choose to live into rural areas in order for them to be able to practice uh, freely. So uh, there is one woman that is, let's say, the matriarch of one such small community that ha he has been uh, interviewing and going to visit and following. And he was also very much interested in the architecture of these churches that were mainly handmade from wood and other material. Um, and I thought it was a very interesting piece. I mean, he, he, we commissioned the piece to, to, to finish. I thought it was a very interesting piece because um, the whole way that uh, these communities where approach after the war started was completely different. They were kind of embraced uh, after years of being marginalized because, of course, of the Russian um, being considered like, um, you know, repressed from the Russians. They were kind of embraced by Latvian society. Um, this is uh, a presentation uh, and a performance uh, at the opening day from Mariam, who, uh, who is also a poet. Uh, and then I'm going back to Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed's uh, piece was an ode to boycott. And it was a very interesting piece to think um, because he um, um, he has found some uh, images of these uh, stilts. Are they called stilts in English? I think, yeah. Um, uh, in uh, in Vietnam uh, during the what the Vietnamese call the American War and what the Americans call the Vietnamese War, um, where um, a lot of peasants were um, complaining by doing these let's say um, marches on stilts, where they they had also a lot of uh, uh, flags on the stilts that showed the basic um, <clears throat> commodities that were lacking because of uh, of the war and because of uh, of being cut off. Uh, and he was thinking of this idea of, of the stilts, and uh, um, this is a piece, as I said, that we co-commissioned with the Dhaka Art Summit. And it was interesting that the same, um, uh, the same, let's say, mode of complaining uh, was was happening also in Bangladesh, and there was this use of of uh, of stilts. Um, but funnily enough, the stilts seem to be an international <laughs> tool. Uh, they were also used uh, in Latvia by farmers in rural communities, not to complain and not uh, as. Uh, uh, you know, uh, tools for uh, for marches, but uh, for traditional dance. Um, but um, 
because of the war, Ahmed started thinking of this idea of the boycott uh, and what does the boycott mean for the population that necessarily doesn't abide or doesn't share, you know, the ideologies of their of their government. Um, so um, the uh, he found the four um, uh, material that were lacking during the Ukraine war in Kiev uh, for the first month, and it was petrol, gas, and um, uh, a steel and and oil, cooking oil. Um, and he, um, and of course, he tried to kind of go into the history of, of Latvia during the revolution. Uh, and he discovered that were similar uh, commodities that were scarce because of, uh, of uh, the Soviets trying to, um, you know, punish the, the ones that were trying to get off the, uh, off the rule. Um, and there was a, an incredibly beautiful performance that happened with traditional musicians uh, and uh, folk dancers um, uh, in the opening night where you had the stilt the stilt uh, performers walking together with this group of uh, of singers and there you see uh, the artist uh, with <laughs> with uh, this entourage um, and I think I'm going to stop here because it's it, it it's been an hour yes I think I went a little bit over um, I wanted to also if I may very quickly uh, make a juxtaposition uh, also with uh, machinations, which uh, which is an exhibition that I curated this last summer um, at Reina Sofia in in Madrid. Um, again, an exhibition that looks into forms of resistance, but through the spec the, the specter of uh, of Deleuze and Gattari uh, in relationship also to this idea of the machine and the social machine that they had developed after following on on Foucault. Um, and um, it's interesting to see, this is another piece by Sami Balohi that is discussing uh, Lumumbasi in relationship to um, the way that the Belgians wanted to rearrange the whole city and to create, let's say, a linear structure and a footprint for streets and avenues and neighborhoods where uh, also you had segregation uh, plans happening for the locals and for the colonials. Uh, the colonial uh, employees, etc. Um, and uh, uh, I chose also to show you this just maybe to ignite a conversation for, for the second part, um, which is uh, Abdullahi Musallam Zarara, which is a very important Palestinian uh, painter that uh, passed away in 2020. He was part of also of the latest Sarja Biennial. Um, and Rabi Mroe, uh, all of them also discussing uh, revolution and let's say the manifestations and the performative elements of, of revolution and resistance uh, together with, I'm just choosing four pieces which were very important for me um, and were my choices, uh, Rayane Tabet and Taring Padi. Uh, again, with Taring Padi, we have, you know, the conscious choice of us as a curatorial team to insert uh, their piece. It was the last piece that we decided on after Documenta 15 and the whole, you know, uh, shebang that happened there. And Rayane Tabet also discussing the history of colonialism uh, in relationship to nomad populations. Um, and I'll stop here. I think maybe we, we discuss the second part a little bit more about how history and current affairs can change very much what you can or cannot uh, show or scan and core cannot speak about. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions. If you can, you see them, Ileana? Yeah, let me just uh, go off the. Okay. Here we go. So, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I have been able to purchase two copies of Batsitis' selected poems while you have been speaking. Is there a biography of Batsitis in English? Is there a catalog for survival kit? Again, thank you. There is a catalog for survival kit, yes. I might actually have one here in my office. My daughter was playing with it the other day. I don't know. She might have eaten it also because she's <laughs> fighting things now currently. Uh, there is one and you can contact LCCA and uh, they would be happy to, to send it to you. 
It was Zoe Leonard. Yes, great. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in the legacy of one-off projects like the Survival Kit. If you think of exhibitions as mode of writing new narratives, how do you ensure their legacy in the future? Is this something you plan alongside the exhibition? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, again, I was the, the guest. Huh? I was the invited curator. Um, I mean, um, Solvita Kress, who is the, the director of, of LCCA. I mean, this whole thing is her, um, you know, her uh, her child let's say and she has gone through uh hell to be able to sustain um uh, a yearly edition uh, of survival kit also given the fact that there is very little structural funding um you know in countries of the periphery uh, things are not uh you know there is no let's say uh, infrastructure to support contemporary art or it's being made now let's let's say that um so um I mean, it, there is a legacy of continuity, which is something that is ensured through a lot of work, I think, from the LCCA. But then um, if you ask for, 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 from the legacy of my personal point of view of having done this one off project and then this kind of idea slowly dies, if this is what you're asking, I think not, uh, mainly because they the process of you know formulating let's say a question for an exhibition um always is one that gives birth to new ideas or new chapters um and in a way uh having you know thinking about it now after a year and a half has passed it was a, a, um, a very much a careful consideration of a locality where I parachute in with specific ideas that I have about things or, um, you know, a, a big part of ignorance when it comes to, to the histories of the Baltic states. Um, and I chose to be very careful and slow about it and to also share, um, you know, authorship, uh, specifically when it comes to the public program, for instance, because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm only there for specific months. If you kind of pair all my visits together, it's like not more than a month and a half. Um, and I, I don't think that I have the, the right to be speaking about someone. I can sp speak, um, you know, alongside someone, as Trintin Minha says, but I don't speak about someone. So it's better that a local curator um, takes care of the public program and discusses it with me rather than me doing it, for instance. Um, and there were a lot of different legacies and, and uh, important things that happened when I was not even there during the public program. Okay, so with that, um, Ileana, thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. We will um, jump on with the students. For those who are still on, thank you for coming. Next week, Anthony Huberman um, will be with us from New York. And um, with that, we will close. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.